So, Kurt Campbell, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, the annual Ausmin talks, the Australian ministerial talks between, uh, excuse me, the ministerial talks between Australia and the United States involving the Defence Minister, the Foreign Minister, uh, and their US counterparts, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defence. These happen every year this year in Washington. And I thought I'd ask you actually, try to take the perspective of a, uh, of a student. We have a lot of students who look at the interpreter. And I know when I was a student, I was always really curious about what actually goes on in these meetings. So rather than getting you to, uh, to be a pundit here, let me ask you about the mechanics. What actually goes on in the room? Uh, is, it, is it very casual or is it incredibly formal? Do only the senior people speak? Does everyone sort of muck in? How does it, how does it go? Great, Sam. And um, appreciate the question and appreciate the opportunity to be uh, uh, on the interpreter. This is great. Um, uh, first, the Osman is uh, one of the oldest institutions that we have for managing uh, this uh, complex and I think wonderful relationship between the United States and Australia. Every year, the Secretaries of State and Defense, as you suggest, either travel to Australia or uh, their counterparts come up to Washington mm -hmm. or some part of the United States um, for these meetings. Um, in addition, as part of OSMEN, there is a military component in which increasingly the chairman of the Joint Chiefs meets with uh, his counterpart uh, uh, as part of these discussions. And so there is a robust set of discussions on defense, which is really the foundation of the relationship, increasingly on intelligence and then on diplomacy uh, going forward. I think, in fact, it is a mixture of both um, rather formalized presentations and sort of just informal discussions about either our bilateral relationship or the region as a whole. Uh, normally, uh, we did one of our Osmans during the four years I was at the State Department in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Secretary Panetta, who is a native of Northern California, insisted on taking us to his favorite uh Italian restaurant down on the wharf. It was lovely and fun. And there just is a sense of camaraderie and uh, comfort and shared uh, uh, values and common experience that animates the meetings between the United States and Australia that I've experienced nowhere else. So they are um, they are uh, intense meetings, but they're comfortable, they're friendly. Uh, normally, we do much of the work in advance, and so it's uh, uh, reaffirming at the highest levels on both sides of our government, often uh, complex diplomatic or military arrangements that have been worked on sometimes for years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it's fair to say we all look forward to Osmonds. Uh, they were generally quite productive and um, uh, usually the chemistry between the leaders uh, uh, is quite good. So when you say that a lot of the work gets done in preparation, that implies that the agenda also is set quite early on in the piece. Does that mean that Osman is dominated by uh, long-term issues or does the stuff that we're reading about in the papers today, for mm -hmm. instance, does that make it onto the agenda? Um, look, it'll be unavoidable. Mm. Uh, some of the challenges that are taking place with respect to the revelations about spying, those will be addressed quietly and there will be some back and forth. But basically, these are planning um, uh, uh, opportunities in which uh, both Australia and the United States really look ahead and try to guide the direction of uh, future interactions between our, our two countries and the world that we live in. So I expect over the course of the coming Osman, there will be interactions about some of our military um, uh, role uh, in the region and in Australia, some engagement about our diplomacy with China. Hmm. There will be discussions about the ambitions of the new government in Australia to raise defense spending. There will be um, examinations of where uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, defense spending is going. Um, overall, these are comprehensive discussions. The agenda is primarily poised to reflect on strategic issues, where we're heading in the future. But there will undeniably, as I said, be 
discussion of some of the challenges that we're facing currently. So the picture you paint is of a generally uh, a very friendly uh, atmosphere. Do these discussions ever become prickly at all? Uh, some commentators, oh, yeah. for instance, have uh, have argued that uh, Australia has a right to be a little bit upset with the United States for uh, for the fact that the Snowden revelations came out at all and have put Australia in a difficult position with Indonesia right now. On the other hand, um, we've heard uh, some American commentators say that uh, Australia needs to do more on defence spending, yeah. for instance. So do the two sides... Yeah, look, the, the truth is we both understand the domestic constraints mm. that uh, each of the governments uh, deal with. I think there is uh, a recognition that, by and large, we are like-minded. Um, I think it's often important in these meetings for one side or the other to lodge careful um, uh, areas of concern. Uh, I can tell you that during the period of WikiLeaks, uh, Australian counterparts were quite clear with the United States about certain aspects of our mm -hmm. handling of it that they were uncomfortable with and uh, I thought were incorrect. And I think we've quietly asked Australia in the past about the direction of defense spending and you know how it sees its role uh, in Asia. And I think there have been periods in both Iraq and Afghanistan where the Australians made clear that they needed to be consulted if there were to be any changes in strategy going forward. So yeah, there are intense interactions, but I, I would say that those interactions take place in a larger context of partnership and trust. Mm. Last question. You're, of course, closely associated with the pivot, and I've noticed in your the discussions I've witnessed so far, you tend to say, quote, unquote, pivot. Um, now, now, I want to ask you, do, do you think the United States in these Osmin talks will be in, uh, in, in a you know, reassurance mode, if you like, because there is a perception in Australia that the pivot or the rebalance has uh, stalled somewhat. I think that's the case. And I think you will see um, strong uh, views put forward, particularly by Secretary Hegel, who I think has done a very able job in Asia um, uh, about why and how the United States will go about its business in Asia. And I'm comfortable by that. But I do think there is a bit of reassurance that's necessary after the unfortunate, but again, I think understandable cancellation of the president's visit to Asia uh, during uh, the time of the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum. Ultimately, um, uh, I think that uh, some of those setbacks are recoverable. And I think uh, the Osman, which is, uh, again, it's a full Osman. It's our fifth year in a row. That's significant. I think uh, can go a long way towards uh, that kind of reassurance. Look, the reason um, there there's always debate about the appropriate terminology, whether mm -hmm. it's rebalance or pivot. Um, funny story, I think, you know, Secretary Clinton and I and others have been more um, associated with the term pivot and some in the White House more with the term rebalance. I, I think the, the underlying fact is more the contents of the policy than the naming of it. But I will tell you that there was a period where our friends uh, at the National Security Council were quite determined that everyone would use the term rebalance, and we all did, only to find that the president actually prefers, in some respects, the term the pivot. Ultimately, I think the unintended consequences of the term pivot suggested a turning away uh, of the United States from uh, uh, the Middle East and Europe. And that was certainly not our intention. And some suggested that the term pivot was had a harder edge and occasionally was misinterpreted by Chinese friends and that the rebalance was uh, somehow less um, uh, sharp. Mm. I'm not sure those distinctions are as accurate. The reason I kind of like rebalance, though, is that it suggests an ongoing, innovative process that requires course corrections and adaptation. And I think that is what, in fact, the policy demands going forward. Mm. But for better or for worse, I think I'm stuck with the term pivot. <laughs> Good. Thanks for your time. Sam, thank you very much. It's great to be with you.